it. There we go. Um, so anyway, welcome. Um, thank you for being here. Today, I'm gonna start with a land acknowledgement before we begin. So I would like to begin by acknowledging that I gather today on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish peoples who have lived in the Salish Sea Basin through the San Juan Islands of the North Cascades watershed from time immemorial. Please join me in expressing our deepest respect and gratitude for our indigenous neighbors, the Lummi Nation and Nooksack tribe for their enduring care and protection of our shared lands and waterways. I invite you to acknowledge the land you live on by entering your name, institution, and tribal land in the chat. And you can do that throughout the meeting. Um, and um, I think we'll just get started. So um, really quickly, kind of already touched on this, but as we know, quarterly symposiums are held for our program participants to come together and talk about a specific social justice topic and specifically how it applies to their project category. Um, and this is kind of just to help us go forward and be good leaders um, and give people tools that they might not have had naturally as resources on their campus um, to be go forth and be good leaders. Um, today we chose uh, the topic community resiliency and recovery, which is obviously an extremely broad topic. Um, and it's really hard to narrow down into one specific lens. So that's why we kind of decided that a panelist or a panelist discussion would be really helpful. Um, but we wanted to talk about this just because we thought that it would be really relevant to the world as we're all the world is always going through um, stuff and um, tragedy and um, this is by no means the, not the only time that there is community trauma happening. Um, it's I think right now more people are aware of it than ever. And so it's important to have these conversations. Um, so today we have three lovely panelists. We have Hilaire Echohawk. Uh, Rachel Colston and Ursula Vorweiler, and we will be hearing from each of them for about 10 minutes, and then we'll go into um, a panelist discussion, and then you will all go into your breakout rooms for about uh, 30, 45 minutes, um, depending on how much time we have, and then um, we'll all come back together and do some final reflections. Um, so thank you again for you all being here. Um, we're, I'm going to hand it off to our first panelist of the day who is Ursula Volweiler from the Community Resilience Initiative. Um, so thank you, Ursula, so much for being here. And I, we're excited to hear from you. Thank you, Maddie, for this introduction. Um, uh, thank you all for being here and thank you for having me. I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about me personally and then about the community where I work, just to give you some, some a, a little bit of a backdrop about my work. I was born and raised in Germany. I came to the United States in my late 20s, um, worked in the software industry, uh, got totally burnt out as a linguist, um, went back to school in my mid 40s to become a, an elementary school teacher, which had always been a dream of mine. And trying to figure out my teaching philosophy, I had to come to terms with who I was growing up in foster care in Germany, um, fighting a serious case of anorexia nervosa at the age of 15. Um, and also the kids in my classroom uh, in, in Kent, in the Kent School District, I taught um, multi-age second and third grade. Most of these kids spoke another language at home. So suddenly I found myself among other English language learners. And so I had to come to terms with that part of my identity as well. Um, being an English language learner and the importance of, of language, both as, as it shapes your identity, your native language, but also a foreign language as a communication tool. And so fast forward going to Walla Walla, I taught at the community college there. And here I worked with parents, with immigrant parents teaching ESL. I had finished my master's degree in English as a second language at that time. And it was, I, I felt like I was surrounded by trauma, but incredible resilience as well. And Walla Walla at the time was at the forefront of the resilience movement. Uh, my predecessor in this role, Terry Barilla, she had done a lot of work with the ACE study and, and really tried to bring uh, resilience into, into the community. And so I'm going to share my screen now and give you a little bit of information about Walla Walla 
and, and what that resilience work means. Can you all see that? Yes. yes. There we go. So I would also like to acknowledge um, that Walla Walla is locate, located on the native lands of the Cayuse, um, the Umatilla and the Walla Walla people and the Nez Perce tribe. Um, the population is about roughly 33,000 of, of the of Walla Walla proper, 65% white, about 25% immigrants, mostly from Latin America, but more and more we also see immigrants from Africa, from Asia. So it's becoming more of a, a diverse community. And about roughly 13% live in poverty. And I think this number is, is too low because a lot of the immigrants in our community are undocumented. So the, num the actual number is probably much higher and that compares just a comparison with what the, the Washington uh, poverty rate is. And it is, it is an interesting community. There's a lot of push and pull between old money, large wheat farms, um, people who would really like to keep things the way they were 100 years ago and, and preserve the, that, that power structure. And then you have the wine industry, which is very hip and affluent and, and the, the tourism that it brings to town. And so you have these two extremes. You have extreme affluence, old and new, and extreme poverty. And it's the, it's the immigrants who mostly provide the, the workforce for the agriculture and the service industry that drive uh, all of these, these different sectors, uh, but they don't partake uh, in the profits. Uh, they don't partake in the benefits. Um, and because most people work in agriculture and the service industry, we have severe food insecurity in the winter uh, because there are just no jobs. Tourists don't come to Walla Walla, it's bitter cold in the winter. So we have a lot of issues, especially in the winter. Um, our organization approaches resilience work from a very specific perspective. We do a lot of national training, but as the local, uh, the lo local community resilience person, I try to, to adapt that training to whoever my audience is and whatever time my audience can give me. And so we start with the knowledge, we teach about the sciences, the near sciences, the neurobiology, the epigenetics, the ACE studies and resilience. And, and we work toward a shift in our audience that it, it's this shift from what is wrong with this person to not only what has happened to this person, but how does this person interpret what has happened to him or her? And so from that inside shift, not just looking at the behavior, but really looking beneath the behavior of the need that drives the behavior, we develop strategies for individuals and hopefully also then structures in the community. That's where the community resilience then happens is to make this whole um, movement sustainable within the organizations and within the system in the community. And we always warn people that if you just go out and try out strategies without understanding the near sciences, you can actually do some serious harm to yourself and to others. And so when we look at the ACEs, we don't just look at the original ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences, which are the worst because they happen to children who have no agency and whose brains are growing rapidly, but also the other ACEs that we, we see more and more today. Uh, adverse circuitry expression simply meaning somebody's wired differently, which our society is very quick to describe as a disability. The adverse community environments, the poverty, the, the, the lack of access, the food deserts, uh, the, the homelessness, uh, the lack of affordable housing. Then the adverse cultural exposures, all the isms that should be wasms, um, racism, sexism, ageism, and so forth. And then the adverse catastrophic events, which we have all lived through and, and are living through. I mean, the pandemic, um, global, uh, um, global warming or climate change. So all of these, these, the original ACE study really focused on adverse childhood experiences, but 
it kind of uh, it, it focused too much on families and, and, and many in the community blame families for ACEs without really understanding that it, it, ACEs are a systemic issue. And that's how we have to look at them through the lens of the social determinants of health. And so um, we need to get from me to we. That's really what community resilience is all about. Individual resilience is great because we can't give what we don't have, but we need to move to that, that higher level. And so it starts with you examining who are you? Are you the chaos or the calm in the room? And community resilience relies heavily on social cohesion, helping people helping each other and working toward that common good, which nowadays, I think with this political division that we're seeing everywhere is getting harder and harder. And we have found uh, through studies in Washington state that only contextual resilience, really the community resilience mitigates outcomes for children and youth. They need those role models. Um, we also need to look at protective factors and risk factors, and, and we can't assume that, um, I can't assume that my protective factors are everybody else's risk uh, protective factors. As a matter of fact, sometimes one person's protective factor is another person's risk factor. So we really need to uh, listen to people's stories in the community and, and figure out what is it that they need and not assume. Um, Community resilience is all about massive collective trauma in the wake of climate change. Everybody, uh, government agencies, everybody wants to invest in infrastructure, but what about people? What about the human infrastructure? And so my advice to you is to organize and build coalitions. You can't do it on your own. And there is a new national movement start and starting, which I would highly recommend for you that you look into. It's uh, traumacampaign.org. They right now teach um, workshops every second Friday. Um, I, would, I would really recommend that you, you jump on that wagon. And that is it for me. I would love to hear from you. Thank you for having me here today. And um, I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much, Ursula. We appreciate it. That was um, obviously very applicable and um, concrete knowledge for us. Um, so thank you so much for starting it off. Um, next, uh, we're going to hear from our second panelist, um, Rachel Colston, who I should have co-host privileges now. Um, and I'm going to hand the floor over to you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'd like to thank my mentor, um, Kat. She had connected me with Madeline to um, speak and be with you all today. Um, so just a, briefly a, a little bit about me. I am a mental health therapist. Um, I orient towards um, liberation psychology, which centers uh, collectivism, abolition, decolonization practices, affirming diverse identities and understanding interlocking systems of oppression with a, a trauma-informed um, and person-centered focus. As Ursula said, um, looking at what happened to you rather than what's wrong with you. Um, so today I wanted to talk um, because I am a learner when it comes to transformative justice. Um, I'd like to have a dialogue. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that I make sure I'm keeping on time here. Okay. I don't know if it's gonna, I might just have to stick into this view, but I'd like to have a dialogue about um, accountability's place in community resiliency. To start off, what could it be like to make um, collective efforts to heal a community after experiencing harm? I, I wanna stay in an imaginative state and a creative state. Can we imagine um, collective healing outside the framework of punishment, you know, punishing um, institutions punishing um, individuals. Uh, resourcing, pod 
pods and pod mapping um, can be the reply to Dr. Ann Russo's question in her post, 10 Strategies for Cultivating Community Accountability. Ann Russo is a um, director of a woman's center and professor at DePaul University. Um, she does a lot of community work uh, around accountability, um, resiliency. What So shifting the question, what can we do rather than what can I do to heal after experiencing harm as a community? And so we ask, what are pods in pod mapping? Pods are a concept developed by Mia Mingus. Um, Mia Mingus is a um, member of the Bay Area Transformative uh, Justice Collective. Um, in 2014, they created this concept of pods. Uh, pods are a kind of collective relationship utilized in transformative justice work. How do we resource pods? As Mia Mingus wrote, um, pods refer to people who can provide support to one another before, through, and after harmful, violent, and abusive experiences. And this can be from individuals, again, this can be from institutions, um, this can be from structures, this can be from um, uh, environmental factors. And then we ask, who can resource pods? It may be anyone who is the survivor of, witness of, and or person who has done harm. Um, so anyone can access this. And then we ask who makes up a pod? Um, your pod map is made as me, uh, up of people who you want to call on if violence, um, harm, or abuse happened to you, or the people you would call on if you wanted support in taking accountability for violence, harm, or abuse that you've done, or if um, you witnessed violence, or if someone you care about was being violent or abused. And these can be different groups of people or the same. The act of pod mapping helps you identify who's in each of these groups to foster an understanding of your social ecosystem in your community that goes beyond shallow relationships or just politics and, and focuses on, as Mia Mingus wrote, um, building solid pods of people through a relationship and trust. And so um, just to lead in this, activity here. Um, this is what pod mapping looks like. Um, in the center in the gray circle is you. Um, you might see a cluster around of um, bold, um, bold circles. And in those circles, you would fill in people that you think would be in your pod. Um, and then the you may be able to make out the dotted line circles around those bold circles. And in those circles, you put people who um, could be in your pod. It helps you look at um, what is required for these people to be moved into your pod, into these bold circles. Um, you ask, um, is, trust, is more trust needed? Is a stronger connection needed? Um, what is required in this relationship? Do we need just to get to know each other better? What's required in this relationship for them to move inward into the bold circles? And then lastly is institutions um, in those solid but um, circles on the outside. It could be organizations that you wanna to turn to. It can be institutions that you wanna to turn to. Um, it can be crisis lines. It can be um, peer support centers. Um, who would you turn to if you're experiencing harm? Who would you turn to um, if you are um, you are someone who has done harm? And um, who would you turn to if you have potentially witnessed harm? Um, and so asking those questions. And I just wanna highlight um, Mia Mingus and Dr. Ann Russo's work. Um, I really encourage folks to look up, um, you know, the, the writings that they've done. Um, Mia Mingus has a blog and it, it's very, um, it talks about a lot of this from a disability justice lens. 
and as she puts it, disability justice and centering it um, is love at the end of the day. And I think that um, love in and of itself is, is so vital to community resilience. Um, so again, building community resilience requires building relationships based on trust, sharing a common language. That doesn't mean, um, you know, English versus, um, you know, Spanish maybe. It, it means sharing a, a ability to hold a dialogue. Um, and then that's um, consensually co-created, having these discussions, slowing down. And then that of itself is um, transformative and transformative of harm and helps build resiliency. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. Um, and thank you so much. Thank again. Thank you so much for um, for allowing me to be here today. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, again, really appreciate your perspective. Um, and I think that pod mapping activity is something that um, is applicable to everyone, but also something that we can use in our communities and um, directly with maybe in mentorship opportunity or roles and. Um, it's extremely applicable. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to hand it off to our final panelist, um, Hilaire Echohawk, who goes by Echohawk. Um, and let me know you have your spotlighted. Um, and you are good to go. Great. Thank you. I'm Hilaire Echohawk. I'm Pawnee Nation from Pawnee, Oklahoma, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I want to um, thank those that are in attendance and especially want to make a special acknowledgement to the native indigenous people that are present today. I am of the Kicka Hockey Band of the Pawnee Nation. I'm just gonna give you a really brief rundown. Within our Pawnee Nation, we have four chiefs and I am, as I mentioned, a kick a hockey band. I uh, went to a residential school, a Shalako Indian school. If you all are not well versed in a residential school, that would be wonderful to do a, a, perhaps a gathering of uh, looking at the harm that took place uh, globally in Canada, Alaska, US, and all the other indigenous communities and what happened when they uh, came and took our land and our children. And what's happening now, the movement that's happening now that I'm so proud of, um, finding our children that um, were harmed and buried many times at unmarked graves and they're now bringing them back home. I, <clears throat> just wanted to briefly talk, tell you a story. I'm actually a storyteller. So I'm, my presentation is a storyteller. I, um, at a young age, was growing up in Pawnee with my wonderful parents, traditional grandparents, my tribe. And in Pawnee, Oklahoma, where when I was being raised, you many times lived to be in your 40s. That was your, um, it was basically the age that you passed away at. So my parents were 42 and 43 when I was um, a teenager and I ended up going to Alaska with my older brother. And I've spent about 45 years plus up there in this amazing place, but I'm still connected to my tribe and my people in Oklahoma. So I've had some incredibly wonderful, been blessed with some incredible, wonderful, Pawnee teachings and teachings also of the people of Alaska that I share my life with. And I'm gonna tell you a story that happened recently. Prior to my coming down to the States, I was the <clears throat> manager of the language program, the Shmaric language program of the Simshan people in Metlakala, Alaska on a net island. It's a few miles outside of the Canadian waters. There's a Metlakala, British Columbia and a Metlakala, Alaska. And in 1887, a missionary brought <clears throat> little over 800 in shoals, uh, that's their traditional language for canoes, brought them over 
to the United States and that's where they're at now. And that's where my children or my grand grandchildren are at now in Metlakatla, Alaska, this amazing phenomenal place. <clears throat> and so is Metlakatla, British Columbia in the area of their ancestral homeland. While I was the manager, uh, I brought up Dr. Gray Morning. Many of you may know who he is. He's another phenomenal native man. He's a Arapaho and he goes all around the world and assists indigenous peoples to save their language. <clears throat> if you don't know him, you all need to, you all need to contact him. He's just an amazing man. He was there for two weeks in Metlakatla and in that two weeks time, my son, one of my young sons asked me to bring Dr. Gray Morning down to the shul to the canoe because they were going to take him out to the waterfall and that's the first place in 1887 that the four scouts um, canoed up to when they were trying to find a new home and so Dr. Gray Morning and I went down and there it's there's placement for 18 poolers and so we were the 17th and 8th one 18th one we we uh, went on to the Akshul and then we started our journey to the waterfall in Metlakatla, Alaska. As we were halfway there and he was given the commands, my son commanded paddles up. Everybody rose their paddles up and we were halfway to the point of the waterfall and you could see the water flowing down. And my son turned to look at all of us and he said, at this moment, I want everyone to just be silent, put away your phones, just be, the here and now and look at where we're at. Look at these mountains that surround our beautiful home. These beautiful mountains, these sacred mountains. And he said, look at the water, the ocean that has sustained our people. And you, and you can hear the ocean, the waves lapping up against the Akshul and against the shores. And he said, this, these sacred waters are sacred to us. They, they feed us, you know, we can harvest from these waters. And at that moment, it was like somebody had released the eagles, the eagles flew overhead. And he said, I want everyone to just take some, take some moments and think about those that aren't here, those that have left us. And I want us to just take a moment and think about those that have left us. And let's just be, let's just be silent. And so we all said in the canoe, um, Dr. Gray Morning sang this incredibly beautiful song that he was taught by his uncle. It was unbelievable that day. Um, my son then said, for those of you that are carrying a burden and you feel like the world's on your shoulder, you may have a brother or sister a mother, a father, a relative. That's battling addictions. You may have lost a loved one. You may have lost a child. You may not have enough food, enough in your family to, to feed the rest of your, your family for the rest of the month. Mm -hmm. You may have somebody that's in jail. You may have all the worries in the world. And he goes, when we, when we start and we get to the shores, he goes, those of you that choose to, I want you to follow me. I'm gonna call your name out as we approach the shore. So he gave the command and we started paddling and he still spoke to us. <clears throat> the story always overwhelms me. He said, uh, when we get to the shores, I'm going to call your name. And if you choose to, I want you to follow me. But we're going to go down into our sacred waters. And he goes, the science, the world of science has finally caught up with the indigenous teachings, our incredible sacred teachings. He said, it's a known fact that if you immerse yourself in our indigenous teaching, you immerse yourself in these sacred waters that you're gonna reset your body. And he goes, those of you that choose to, if you have the worries of the world on your shoulder, I want you to follow me. And so he pulled us ashore and called out each name. And as 
people began to leave the canoe and stood beside him. I was the last person and I'm a freelance photographer. So I actually photographed this for him. So I was the only one standing on the shore and he said, follow me. And so he went into the waters. He took off his shoes and he started walking and he got reached the shoreline and he continued to walk. And he had 17 people behind him and he went into the ocean and he was up to his neck and he kept going and he disappeared. And those 17 that were following him all disappeared to the ocean. And I stood on the shoreline, I was just amazed. Um, you're actually hearing the short version of the story because I have probably seven more minutes to tell the story. They immersed themselves in the ocean and our sacred waters and they were there for quite some time. The whole water was calm. And then one by one, they popped up. And then my son, as they were coming out, many of them were crying. And he said, when we go into these waters and you're coming out now, you left all those sorrows, all your broken heart, all your anxiety, everything that you're carrying now, you left it behind. And so they came out of the waters and he said, now look around you. Every one of us, we're here for you. This is how we build our community. This is how we heal, that you're not alone. You can contact any one of us. You can call us, you can email us. You can come to our house and you're not alone. We're here. We're here and we're going to grow strong. And we're going to look at this next generation that's coming up. And every one of you, you have left that behind and you don't have to be alone with all your sorrows. They had had many suicides in their family, in the community. And he said, we're here, we are here to help heal your broken heart. And then he said, we're not done yet. Come with me, we're going to the waterfall. And the waterfall was quite um, close, probably took 20 steps to get to the waterfall. And they walked into it. You can walk into the waterfall and you could turn around up against the rock and you could see them. You could see some of their faces and their hands are up. And I took the photos of all of them as they were in the waterfall and the water, sacred water was falling down. And so when they came out of the waterfall, it was a really a great time of rejoicing. And so I'm always reminded, and I tell this story often because in our communities, there's many times such sorrow. There's, um, there's lots to do, lots to do in our communities to heal, but we're not alone. We have all of you that are present here today. Um, as we continue to honor those that have come before us, that we become stronger for those that aren't here yet. And one of the teachings that I was taught in, I worked for a tribe in Alaska as a tribal advisor for the uh, traditional tribal council. And I worked with um, seven incredible spiritual elders. And uh, I would fly in into their village and spend days with them. And they always told me that when you hear, uh, when you hear a language, when you hear story, when you hear people talking about the sacredness of our people, he always said it has to be acknowledged. He goes, if it's not those sacred words were linger in the air and that we have to acknowledge and pay respect to those that have gone on before us, that paid that high price for us, for us to be here today and to continue to fight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Echo Hawk. That was such a beautiful image.
of community. Um, I was just enraptured with your story. So thank you so much. Um, we're going to start off with um, our discussion. Um, we just have a, some discussion questions for our panelists, and then we'll go into our breakout rooms. Um, but just to keep the conversation going, because I want to hear more from all of you. Um, I will copy and paste um, the discussion questions that we have, and it's okay if we don't get to all of them, um, but also um, just so you can all see them. Um, but the, the first question um, I have for you is, um, who do you believe um, should take responsibility for community rebuilding and recovery? Um, and kind of, you can roll with that however you'd like, but um, I'd love to hear from any and all of you. Hi, this is Suzanne Phillips. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I just want to kind of answer that question. I believe that it's it's everybody. Everybody should take responsibility for rebuilding. Um, it's you know a theme, a family. It's a team. It's a joint effort. I, I absolutely agree. Um, I think that um, to be able to rebuild and, and recover is much like what Echo Hawk was saying in her beautiful story. Um, it's realizing that we're not alone and in a, in a lot of ways we, we may have felt it, but we never were. Um, and we all have that responsibility to acknowledge our interconnectedness um, and how much we do um, at the end of the day depend on one another. Um, yeah. I agree, it's, it's all of us. And um, sometimes it's hard thinking of Rachel's pods um, who do you know in the community and who do you not know in the community? Who, who do you, who should you make contact with and who, who is at the table? Who's not at the table? Somebody said to me once, you know, if you're not invited to the table, become the table, but some people are not used to being at the table and, and you, you may have to, um, uh, you may have to really find ways to bring them to the table. And I think traditionally, when I look at, for instance, in, in my community, how it works, it's people who have money, who have time, who feel kind of they can contribute and be the solution, but it's not, it's sometimes not what the community needs because those at the receiving end are never asked what they think they need. And so, you know, we talk a lot about volunteers and things like that, but what does that mean when people um, fight so hard just to put bread on the table. I mean, how do you create that ecosystem where people can actually participate, fully participate? Um, yeah, it's harder than it seems. Ursula, absolutely. It takes so much work to, <laughs> to sit down. Um, a lot of us realize that we don't have a pod. A lot of us realize that um, it's going to take work to create a pod from those building. And I, I, Ursula, I really loved the point that you made about coalition building, because it is, it takes organization, um, especially as you said, when it comes to folks that, um, you know, a lot of us, especially at, um, since this pandemic started, a lot of us realized that we don't have the time and we don't have the resources always to, um, tap into our communities. Um, and it is left to those that are more privileged to take that place, that space. And oftentimes it doesn't center us. It doesn't center most of us um, when it comes to rebuilding and recovery. And it doesn't center um, those of us that are the most vulnerable. Um, so absolutely, Ursula, that's a fantastic point. We have just so many incredible 
strong leaders that are amongst us wherever we go. And I always say we have so many silent leaders that it's time now for them to stand up and join us. So many good things in the world to battle the negative. There's so many incredible, incredible knowledge that's out there. And I always tell my children and uh, when I speak to the native community that how we can't let our ancestors, their battle go in vain, that we need to keep moving forward, that we need to acknowledge their incredible loss to ensure that that loss doesn't come back again, that we just need to keep moving forward. There's great, wonderful elders, there's traditional people, there's powerful nonprofits. There's just, we just need to all need to continue to keep connecting. And I'm just, um, all of you teachers. Kind of building off of that, um, do you all have any specific suggestions or um, maybe stories or examples you can think of people who were formerly silent leaders or more in the background coming forward? Um, just are ways that um, students can get inspiration to do that and get that confidence to come forward. I was up in the um, higher provinces of um, Canada not so long ago, and there was a um, community. They brought all these native people and native folks and from all over the provinces, and they were addressing what was happening in their communities with the mining. And this wonderful, powerful chief stood up and he looked at all of us. There was several hundred of us in this room and he looked at everyone and then he started to speak. And he said that he had heard that they were, they were going to be arriving soon and that there was no way that they could stop because the government, the provinces had given them permission to come in to their traditional land and they were going to start mining. And he said he knew that he had to warn his people because they were oblivious to it and of what could happen because he saw the devastation that was happening to the other reserves that where the mining was that they were poisoning their water and their lands and the people. And he said he looked at, he gathered them all. He said, everybody, every child, every elder, everyone's going to be at this meeting. And when they all arrived, to the community room, he said he just looked at them and he thought, how, how am I going to, how am I going to save them? What are we going to do? And he said he had to inform them. He said when they were all gathered and they all became silent, he said he had two words and he looked at all of them. And he said, they're coming. And that began their fight for their saving their waters and their tr traditional land. And they began to gather resources and all. So as we just continue to educate ourselves, become more involved in the decision-making, um, I love the young energy that I run into. Um, I'm almost 70 and I just love it when I'm around young energy and the innovative minds and and that they seek the knowledge of those that have already um, and continue to fight the battle. I just think that's just so incredibly powerful. I'd like to echo something that Elaire Echohawk said about leaders. Um, we, we tend to think of leaders as strong and articulate and um, I had to really change that image a lot when I was a, a, a community, a neighborhood activist um, in, in Walla Walla uh, for a while. And I, I, I was working specifically in a neighborhood around the, the penitentiary, which is one of those forgotten neighborhoods. And I did a story project um, 
with the people there. And there was one family, uh, I knew the wife very well. Uh, she and I really had a great relationship. And so I didn't want to interview her because I knew her so well. So I interviewed her husband. And I thought I knew this family. And it was amazing what I learned during this interview and, and the quiet strength of this man so impressed me. And it completely reshaped my definition of what a leader is. And so uh, I, I'd encourage all of you to really think about how you interpret that word and, and really go and find out people's story and, and get to know them. Um, there are a lot of leaders out there. I think that that's a beautiful sentiment and I think something that's applicable to all of us is there is leadership everywhere and seeing that leadership in everyone um, and just differently what everyone brings to the table and I think what we've all been talking about um, just kind of that sense of community and supporting each other and if you are able to see that leadership and that initiative and everyone in their own highlighted way that's such a beautiful way for a community to come together and support each other um, and by appreciating each other's strengths, um, which I feel like kind of ties in um, to the question. The first question is, who do you believe should take responsibility? And maybe it's not necessarily a matter of responsibility. It's more so who can step, we all have it in us. And if we all, you know, I think just act on it naturally and harness those things, then we can all come together and demonstrate that leadership and less of a responsibility taking way and more of just a community building way, um, which is really beautiful. Um, and an well, another question, this is just kind of something I was curious about, but um, I, and just kind of to frame it, um, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of having students involved in surrounding communities? And my, um, my idea is to kind of highlight that and just show how um, sometimes leadership and involvement in communities, especially students uh, who aren't from the area, how that can be detrimental. Um, so I just wanted to ask you all your opinions on that and how to kind of avoid that. I think it's wonderful to have students involved in any level of leadership. And I would encourage this, any student, if they go into, onto a new land or they working on whatever, what land they're on now to find out the history, to find out what, who was there before them, before they became colonized and became cities and find out and get to know the, get to know the community, find out what their needs are and uh, I always encourage folks to write uh, or send an email to their tribal council that's around there and just say, I'm, I'm working on this. I uh, would love to have anyone that like to come forward and assist us in it with your knowledge. I it just, it's so important when people I think come onto native land and native lands everywhere to acknowledge that because they may be working on projects that may be similar to what you're working on and you could do it if if they chose a collaborative effort with their youth and their folks I think some advantages of, um, you know, students being involved absolutely is um, the the new ideas that, um, you know, connecting with the with the community, um, they they may you know be able to benefit from the new ideas that you have or the perspective that you have. Um, some disadvantages. Um, I think oftentimes advantages outweigh the disadvantages. I think that um, it's always an opportunity to grow. I, I know that you know harm can 
absolutely be done, you know, by students being connected, especially um, the idea that sometimes their connection is, is more temporary or it becomes more distant. But um, I think it's always a, a place where students can learn, <laughs> um, can, can learn from the community itself. I think the community has a lot to, any community that you enter may have a lot to, um, to teach you. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with the, you bring new perspectives, especially if you come from a different place you may see things that we in the community have gotten so used to, we don't question them anymore. So you have that new perspective. You are also, you will leave probably after you're done with your college years, you will leave this place and you can take these ideas to other places. And while you're in the community, um, you can also influence the curriculum of your institution because I feel that we need to move this resilience work upstream. Um, we, we can't do it always downstream um, one person at a time. It's, uh, so you have this opportunity to report back um, and, and, and influence that curriculum at your institution. Um, I mean, disadvantages, I, I don't see a lot. The only thing I would say, be honest. If you only see projects as an academic experience, people will see through that and they, you, it, it, you know, it, it, you leave a wake behind. And so afterwards, people may not want to work with other students from your institution anymore. Um, that's really the only disadvantage. One disadvantage I have been told is um, students who go on to do humanitarian work um, sometimes are just not prepared for the, for the trauma they're encountering. So self-care, take care of yourself, do the heavy self-analysis of who you are before you try to go out to help others and, and also protect yourself um, so that you don't, don't get traumatized in the process. You are very young. Um, and so um, that vicarious trauma is out there. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Rachel, go ahead. Um, I think Ursula, that's a great point in that a lot of times when, um, and it's it's not, I'm not blaming, um, but I'm just stating that oftentimes with, you know, academic institutions, we may look at things from a very like colonized, very extraction based lens. And so when we enter these communities, we're, we're thinking about like, what can I extract from these communities when it's, or what, what, um, experience can I extract from being, you know, with a new community instead of, um, you know, looking at things more of a, you know, a shared experience, a, a um, egalitarian um, experience. So I, I really appreciated that point. Absolutely. Okay, I think that wraps up our time for our panelist discussion. So we're going to um, lead into our cohort group breakout rooms. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and um, I have our breakout rooms um, laid out. And so then you can all go through and I'll create five breakout rooms. You can all choose which one that you belong to. Um, the pre-assigned breakout rooms don't work very well. Um, for the panel, for panelists, um, you're free to use this time however you feel. Um, and then, um, so if uh, students, if you want to take about a five minute break and then meet back in your breakout rooms at 11.05, um, and then we will meet back together um, as a community at about 11.40. Um, so um, I will also post discussion questions. So let me just share my screen here. Can you guys see that? Okay, so I'll try to zoom out so you can see. So we got the first couple there. 
Let me create the breakout room. Oops. Actually, give me give me one moment. Sorry, everybody. So I have created your rooms and I'm going to share my screen. There we go. All right, so if you want to take this time to go into your breakout rooms. Trying to make this so you can see all of them at once. That helped a little bit. Yeah, I think I can. I think we can maybe see all of them there. If you can't see them, just unmute and let me know, and I can let you know which one you're in. We don't have an option to join a breakout room yet. Oh, weird. Okay, does did that do it? Yes. Okay, cool. Awesome. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Looks like folks found their way, Maddie. Yes, it does. I don't see anyone in room two. I don't know if people just uh, ended up in different rooms or if there was no one from that group here uh, today. Yeah, doc Dr. Suzanne Phillips should be in room two, but um, she's not. And I don't know if there are any of her, if her students are here. Yeah, it looks like maybe none of her students are here today. Yeah, so I might, I might just keep her in there. Yeah, that seems fine. Cool. Awesome. Great. Uh, no broadcast discussion questions. Wow, this is doing, trying to screen share and work on is a really confusing. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so, can't. I think you can probably stop your screen share now yeah, if you want. Yeah, yeah. Let me see if I can actually, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Jeez, yeah, there we go. Stop recording.